स्टूडेंट्स तो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू माय फिफ्थ वीडियो ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ सरफेस केमिस्ट्री इन द फर्स्ट इन द फोर्थ वीडियो वी डिस्कस्ड समथिंग अबाउट क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ कोलाइड्स अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट यू नो वी डिस्कस्ड द मैकेनिज्म ऑफ माइसेल फॉर्मेशन एंड ऑफ कोर्स क्लेंजिंग एक्शन ऑफ सोर्स तो दीस आर द डिस्कशंस दैट वी हैड इन द फोर्थ वीडियो लेट अस सी इन द फिफ्थ वीडियो इन फिफ्थ वीडियो नो वी सी प्रिपरेशन ऑफ कोलाइड्स purification of colloids and of course properties of colloids these are the discussions that we have in the today's video that is fifth video of the chapter surface chemistry right look at this as far as uh, preparation of colloids is concerned you know colloids are the heterogeneous mixtures in which uh, the particles of the substances will be dispersed in a suitable dispersion medium and that is what we call it as a colloidal system at the same time the size of the particles should be maintained in between 1 nanometer to 1000 nanometer all right and of course uh, as far as uh, preparation of colloids are concerned i can make use of uh, yes it is uh, two methods for the preparation of colloids one it will be condensation methods another it will be dispersion methods one it will be condensation methods or you can say that dispersion methods in condensation methods you know that is particles of true solutions will be converted into colloidal solutions in condensation methods you know particles of true solution will be converted into colloidal solution by aggregating molecules of true solution into bigger particles of colloidal size you know in the case of true solution the particle size will be less than 1 nanometer is it not if these molecules undergo aggregation you know you are going to get bigger particles of colloidal size in between 1 nanometer to 1000 nanometer and that process of converting particles of true solutions into colloidal solutions by aggregating the molecules into yes it is colloidal particles in a suitable dispersion medium so that is what we call it as condensation methods under condensation methods you know we we'll see that is chemical methods chemical methods of preparation of colloids these are the examples for uh, yes it is uh, condensation methods that is condensation methods chemical methods of the examples for condensation methods in chemical in chemical methods you know we make use of chemical reactions okay na we make use of chemical reactions for the preparation of colloids here chemical reactions lead to the formation of molecules which undergo aggregation under suitable conditions to form colloidal solutions so that is what we call it as the condensation methods or you can say that chemical methods for the preparation of colloids and of course uh, as far as uh, chemical methods are concerned i can make use of uh, chemical reactions like double decomposition reaction oxidation reaction reduction reaction and of course hydrolysis reactions in order to prepare as it is colloidal solutions so we'll see one by one first of all it is uh, by making use of uh, one chemical reaction what we call it as double decomposition reaction this is uh, one chemical reaction that i can use in order to prepare colloidal solution and this you know when uh, arsenic oxide yes it is reacts with uh, hydrogen sulfide when arsenic oxide reacts with hydrogen sulfide that leads to the formation of uh, arsenic sulfide as2s3 that leads to the formation of arsenic sulfide as2s3 and of course uh, along with the formation of water this is what we call it as uh, one method and of course here the arsenic arsenic sulfide molecules undergo aggregation to form yes it is colloidal particles that is what we call it as you are going to get arsenic sulfide sol here okay na this is one chemical reaction that is double decomposition reaction that i can use for the preparation of arsenic sulfide and of course what i said it's a condensation method because arsenic sulfide molecules undergo aggregation to form bigger colloidal particles having a size in between 1 nanometer to 1000 nanometer let me balance this equation here we have three oxygen atoms that it should be 3h2o number of hydrogens being 6 here therefore it will be as it is 3h2s and of course uh, number of sulfur will be 3 here here also there are three and of course uh, equation is balanced this is what we call it as one method for the preparation of as it is colloid under chemical methods second reaction that i can use for preparation of colloids will be oxidation reaction this is uh, i can make use of this oxidation reaction for the preparation of yes it is uh, colloidal solution yes and of course uh, when sulfur dioxide 
when sulfur dioxide gas reacts with as it is hydrogen sulfide yes and sulfur sulfur dioxide gas is passed through hydrogen sulfide solution that leads to the formation of yes it is sulfur along with the formation of yes it is water there yes this is what we call it as one chemical reaction here sulfur dioxide oxidizes hydrogen sulfide to sulfur sulfur dioxide oxidizes hydrogen sulfide to sulfur and of course uh, the large number of sulfur atoms undergo aggregation to form the colloidal sulfur there now the large number of sulfur atoms undergo aggregation to form colloidal sulfur okay now and of course uh, to balance this equation here we have two oxygen atoms that therefore it should be as it is uh, 2h2o number of hydrogens becomes 4 therefore it should be 2h2s number of sulfur becomes 3 therefore it should be 3 and of course this is uh, sulfur salt that is produced when sulfur dioxide gas is passed through hydrogen sulfide solution so this is what we call it as second method for the preparation of colloids under chemical methods okay now this is oxidation reaction and of course as far as third reaction is concerned i can make use of this reduction reaction or the i can make use of uh, reduction reaction in order to prepare yes it is a colloidal solution now the, for that purpose you know i'll go for one reduction reaction that is when auric chloride solution yes when auric chloride solution reacts with formaldehyde that is hcho and of course in water medium yes when auric chloride that is gold chloride solution when it reacts with formaldehyde yes your what we call it as formaldehyde is a reducing agent that reduces auric chloride auric chloride into gold particles right and of course uh, it is reducing agent it undergoes oxidation to form as it is formic acid yes it undergoes oxidation to form formic acid and of course uh, chloride will be converted to yes it is hcl this is what we call it as one chemical reaction yes let me balance this equation yes look at this uh, oxidation number of chlorine is plus 3 here plus 3 becomes zero change in oxidation number is 3 you multiply that change here oxidation number of carbon is zero here you can calculate and oxidation number of carbon is plus 2 here that you can calculate zero becomes plus 2 means formaldehyde undergoes oxidation change in oxidation number is 2 there that has to be multiplied here yes now the change in oxidation number of carbon in formaldehyde is multiplied to auric chloride change in oxidation number of gold in auric chloride yes is multiplied to here or the illi plus 3 becomes 0 agirudrinda that change in oxidation number is multiplied to here illi plus illi the oxidation number of carbon 0 is 0 becomes plus 2 agate change in oxidation number is 2 that has to be multiplied here illi 2 AuCl3 agirudrinda you have to multiply 2 here yes chlorine 6 agirudrinda it should be 6 HCl or the 3 HCH valva adi koskara 3 0 drinda illi in the multiply model yes look at the equation is balanced here and of course uh, number of oxygen atoms is three, uh, 3 here here it will be 6 and you make it 6 here by multiplying 3 here yes Agagi. number of hydrogen 6 plus 6 12 agate it will be 6 plus 6 12 agate equation is balanced and of course uh, you got here gold salt here gold atoms form in this particular reaction undergo aggregation to form gold salt so this is Another method for the preparation of colloids are that is by reduction reaction and the fourth method is hydrolysis that is by hydrolysis of uh, yes it is certain substances you know you can prepare yes it is uh, uh, colloidal solution here for example when ferric chloride cell ferric chloride undergoes hydrolysis and ferric chloride undergoes hydrolysis and that results in the formation of yes it is uh, ferric hydroxide there okay now that leads to the formation of ferric hydroxide other and of course uh, along with the formation of hcl here other and of course uh, number of chlorine atoms will be 3 here therefore it will be 3 hcl number of hydrogen 6 agate agagi 3 h2 agate number of oxygen atoms 3 there illukura 3 there therefore equation is balanced and of course this is we are going to get ferric hydroxide sol that sol is because of that ferric hydroxide sol is formed by the aggregation of large number of ferric hydroxide molecules so these are all the chemical methods that i can use in order to prepare yes it is colloidal solutions what i said these are all the condensation methods here <clears throat> in these methods you know small molecules undergo aggregation to form uh, bigger particles of colloidal size in between one nanometer to thousand nanometer so this is what we call it as uh, 
the chemical methods for the preparation of colloids. Okay, now, and of course, as I said, these are all condensation methods. Now, let us see uh, one more method that is uh, dispersion method for the preparation of colloids. Dispersion methods for the preparation of colloids. Under dispersion methods, you know, we are supposed to discuss uh, Bridix electric arc method. Yes. So, let us see one more method for the preparation of colloids. It will be Bridix electric arc method. This is an example for dispersion methods. As you know, in dispersion methods, a particles of a suspension will be converted into collateral solution by breaking bigger particles of suspension into a particles of collateral size. So that is what we call it as dispersion method. And of course, uh, this Bridix electric arc method is used to prepare a metal salts like uh, gold salt, silver salt, platinum salt and copper salt that is uh, gold salt, silver salt, platinum salt and copper salts. These salts can be prepared by using Bridix electric arc method. Okay now just observe this is the experimental setup that I can use in order to prepare metal salts and here it is just observe we are I am using two metal plates. The metal plates whose salts to be prepared will be used as electrodes that are connected to high voltage source of electric current. The metal plates whose salts to be prepared will be used as electrodes and they are connected to high voltage source of electric current. For example, you know, if you want to prepare gold salt, you should use gold plates as electrodes. If you want to prepare silver salt, you should use silver plates as electrodes. And these uh, electrodes are different dispersion medium. In this method, in order to prepare gold salt, I can use water as a dispersion medium. The metal plates, no, the metal electrodes are different. Yes, it is a, a dispersion medium. Okay, now, an electric arc is stuck between two metal electrodes. An electric arc is stuck between two metal electrodes. That leads to liberation of large quantity of heat energy. And that heat energy liberated vaporizes metal plates. The vapors of the metals will be condensed into collateral plates due to the freezing mixture around the dispersion medium. Due to the freezing mixture around the dispersion medium. Just observe, dispersion medium is surrounded by freezing mixture or you can say ice bath. When metal plates are struck, you know, when metal plates are struck, a large quantity of heat is liberated. That liberated heat vaporizes the metals. Okay? And these vapors will be condensed into collateral particles due to the cooling effect caused by ice bath. This is how you know collateral particles will be dispersed in dispersion medium that results in the formation of yes it is metal salt like gold salt and of course uh, whatever the salt that we got you know that is unstable in order to stabilize that salt you know we are going to add small quantity of uh, the sodium hydroxide and that is uh, used to stabilize the gold salt or metal salts. So this is what we call it as uh, the one of the dispersion methods for the preparation of gold salt or you can say silver salt, platinum salt and copper salt and that is by the method called yes it is uh, Bridix electric arc method and of course uh, as far as Bridix electric arc method is concerned it involves dispersion followed by condensation this method involves dispersion followed by condensation condensation because you know in the beginning metal plates will be vaporized that is dispersion and these vapors will be condensed into colloidal particles that is condensation is it not because of that you know this Bridix electric arc method involves that is dispersion followed by condensation even then this can be taken as an example for yes it is uh, the dispersion methods for the preparation of collides because overall effect is conversion of bigger particles into particles of collides so this is what we call it as Bridix electric arc method for the preparation of collides. Now let us see one more method for the preparation of collides and that too one more dispersion method for the preparation of collides and it will be peptidization. Yes. So let us see one more method for the preparation of collides. It will be peptidization. Once again, peptidization is an example for dispersion methods for the preparation of collides. And as far as peptidization is concerned, it is a process of converting freshly prepared precipitate into colloidal solution by shaking it with dispersion medium in presence of small amount of electrolytes and that is what we call it as peptidization and the electrolyte used in peptidization is called as peptizing agent let me repeat peptidization refers to the 
process of converting freshly prepared precipitate into colloidal solution by shaking it with dispersion medium in presence of small amount of electrolyte. What I said, electrolyte used in peptidization is called a peptidizing agent. For example, when freshly prepared ferric hydroxide precipitate, freshly prepared ferric hydroxide precipitate, when it is uh, a shaken with a small amount of ferric chloride, this is electrolyte, okay now, then what happens, you know, that results in the formation of uh, reddish brown colored colloidal solution of ferric hydroxide, that results in the formation of reddish brown colored colloidal solution of ferric hydroxide, that is represented as FeOH thrice bar Fe3 plus, this is uh, ferric hydroxide salt, just observe, there is a vertical line that separates FeOH thrice and Fe3 plus ions. I'll get you the reason why I am writing like this. Okay, now. Similarly, when freshly prepared silver iodide is shaken with small amount of potassium iodide, and that results in the formation of silver iodide salt that can be represented as AgI I minus. So this is what we call it as AgI I minus. Look at this. Uh, in this particular example. Freshly prepared ferric hydroxide is a shaken with an electrolyte, yes it is ferric chloride and of course uh, this ferric chloride is known as peptizing agent for ferric hydroxide salt. Similarly, in the case of silver iodide salt, potassium iodide is used as a, yes it is peptizing agent and this is an electrolyte used for preparing silver iodide salt. So this is uh, the preparation of salts or you can say colloidal solutions by shaking freshly prepared precipitate of a particular substance with a suitable electrolyte in presence of dispersion medium. So that is what we call it as peptization. And of course, uh, just observe, I am using the term here, freshly prepared precipitate. That's because, you know, in the case of freshly prepared precipitates, you know, the intermolecular force of attractions among the particles of the precipitate will be relatively small. In the case of freshly prepared precipitates, the intermolecular force of attractions among the particles of precipitate will be relatively small. Thereby, we can easily convert freshly, precipi freshly prepared precipitate into colloidal solution. And that's why, you know, we prefer freshly prepared precipitate of a substance in order to prepare. Yes, it is a, a colloidal solution. What exactly happened when a precipitate is shaken with electrolyte? That's the next question. Why freshly prepared precipitate is converted into colloidal solution upon adding suitable electrolyte? That's the question. No, the reason is as far as uh, peptidization is concerned, just observe precipitate is characterized by yes, it is a certain surface like this, is it not? That is, that precipitate is characterized by uneven surface. Or the, the surface of precipitate is characterized by various cracks, peaks, edges, is it not? And because of that, you know. This precipitate is going to absorb one of the ions from the electrolyte. This particular precipitate is going to absorb one of the ions from electrolyte. Thereby, a layer of similar charges is formed on the surface of precipitate. That is, this, pre this precipitate that we use in the peptidization is going to absorb one of the ions from the electrolyte and that results in formation of layer of similar charges for example in the case of ferric hydroxide this ferric hydroxide adsorbs ferric ions from ferric chloride this ferric hydroxide adsorbs ferric ions from ferric chloride because of that there is a layer of positive charges there is a layer of positive charges over the surface of precipitate there is a layer of positive charges over the surface of ferric hydroxide precipitate yes and just observe uh, the presence of uh, yes it is uh, similar charges over the surface of uh, yes it is ferric hydroxide and what happens you know due to the presence of similar charges over the surface of precipitate that results in repulsion between similar charges that results in repulsion between similar charges and that leads to breaking of uh, a bigger precipitate into colloidal particle that results into that, that results in breaking of a bigger particle of precipitate into colloidal particle and thereby yes it is 
conversion of precipitate into colloidal solution takes place in presence of as it is a suitable electrolyte and generally as far as peptidization is concerned during peptidization a freshly prepared precipitate is going to absorb ion from the electrolyte which is common to the ions in the precipitate look at this ferric hydroxide okay na absorbs fe3 plus ion because fe3 plus ions are common to the ferric ions present in ferric hydroxide or similarly silver iodide absorb i minus ions because i minus ions are common to the silver iodide precipitate and that is what we call it as the absorption of the common ion on the surface of precipitate is main cause for the conversion of freshly prepared precipitate into colloidal solution agbodala and of course uh, yes it is now at this moment let me define peptidization as process of converting freshly prepared precipitate into colloidal solution by mixing it with uh, a dispersion medium in presence of small amount of electrolyte Let's just observe one more term i am using here that is small amount of electrolyte because you know in presence of excess electrolyte destabilization of colloidal solution takes place in presence of excess electrolyte destabilization of colloidal solution takes place because of that you know we are going to use a, a small amount of electrolyte which is enough to bring about peptidization okay na and why that presence of excess electrolyte leads to destabilization of colloidal solution that we discuss in the later discussions agbodala so this is what we call it as peptidization yes now at this moment you know we'll take up next discussion that is purification of colloids agbodala we'll see that yes so now let us see next discussion under under colloids it will be purification of colloids as usual purification refers to the removal of impurities associated with colloidal solutions just you know in the simple meaning you know the simple meaning of the purification of colloids is removal of impurities associated with colloidal solutions that is called purification of colloids and these colloids prepared by the various methods will be associated with uh, excess electrolytes and soluble impurities it is very essential to remove those excess electrolytes and soluble soluble impurities from the colloidal solutions because you know if excess electrolytes are present in colloidal solution that is going to destabilize colloidal solution that to discuss later okay na as far as uh, the definition of uh, purification of colloids is concerned the process of reducing amount of impurities in the colloidal solution to a requisite minimum is called purification of colloids the process of minimizing amount of impurities in a colloidal solution to a requisite minimum is called as uh, purification of colloids so agadre why should i use the term requisite minimum right as i said presence of excess electrolytes in the colloidal solution is going to destabilize colloidal system so also if all the impurities present in the colloidal solution are completely removed then also colloidal solution become unstable so because of that you know it is very essential to maintain a minimum concentration of electrolytes in the colloidal solutions that imparts stability to the colloidal systems so because of that you know i am using the term there that is the process of reducing amount of impurities in colloidal solutions to a requisite minimum agbodala and of course uh, purification of colloids can be brought about by three methods one it will be dialysis or it will be dialysis second it will be electrodialysis second it will be electrodialysis third it will be yes it is ultra filtration these are the three methods that we can use to bring about purification of colloids we we'll see one by one yes And as far as dialysis is concerned in dialysis you know we are going to remove that is uh, uh, particles of electrolytes and soluble impurities from the colloidal solution by means of diffusion through a suitable membrane by by means of diffusion through suitable membrane and that is what we call it as dialysis so agadre dialysis refers to the process of uh, removal of dissolved substances from colloidal solution by means of diffusion through a suitable membrane and that is what we call it as dialysis and of course uh, in order to bring about dialysis you know 
I can make use of uh, some membranes, right? Some membranes which will be suitable for uh, removal of uh, impurities from collateral solutions. To see those membranes to be used to bring about dialysis, one it will be animal membrane. And it will be animal membrane, yes. And this is also called as uh, bladder. Also called as bladder. Second, it will be parchment paper, yes. Second, it will be parchment paper. This is one more membrane that I can use to bring about dialysis. Third, it will be cellophane acetate yes, sheet. That is, third, it will be a cellophane sheet is used to bring about dialysis. These are the three membranes that I can use to bring about yesterday's dialysis. As far as uh, these membranes are concerned, these membranes are permeable for the particles of electrolytes and soluble impurities. Or you can say, these membranes, you know, they allow, that is, electrolytes and uh, soluble impurities to pass through them, but not the colloidal particles, because the size of the colloidal particles will be greater than the pore size of these membranes. And that property I can use to bring about purification of colloidal solutions. And that property I can use in order to bring about purification of colloids. And that is what we call it as dialysis. And of course, uh, in order to bring about dialysis, you know, I can make use of this apparatus. What we call it as dialyzer. Dialyzer is an apparatus that I can use to bring about dialysis. Look at this dialyzer. It consists of a bag of uh, suitable membrane in which colloidal solution to be purified is placed. Dialyzer consists of a bag of suitable membrane in which colloidal solution to be purified is placed. And this bag containing colloidal solution is suspended in another vessel in which fresh water flows continuously. This particular bag containing colloidal solution is suspended in another vessel in which water flows, fresh water flows continuously. Observe here, here is an inlet for the, yes it is flow of water or the water enters into the vessel through this inlet, water flows out of the vessel through this outlet or the, and of course this collateral solution is associated with electrolytes and soluble impurities and they are the impurities or the, and uh, this membrane is permeable for the particles of electrolytes and soluble impurities. Because of that, you know, the particles of electrolytes and that you can say that uh, the soluble impurities will be diffused into the water through the suitable membrane. Because, you know, that membrane is permeable for that part, uh, soluble impurities and particles of electrolyte. Atwa particles of electrolyte and the ions. This membrane is permeable for ions and soluble impurities. Because of that, those ions and soluble impurities will be passed through the membrane into the water in the vessel. And these uh, impurities diffused into the water, they are going to be removed from the vessel along with the flowing water. And that's why, you know, we need to maintain continuous flow of water in the vessel. We need to maintain the continuous flow of water in the vessel so that, you know, we can maintain lower concentration of impurities in the water present in the vessel. Is it not? And of course, uh, as that uh, process of dialysis continues, the impurities will be removed from the colloidal solution. The impurities will be diffused into the water from the colloidal solution. Finally, you are left with uh, pure colloidal solution in the parchment bag. And of course, uh, the process of dialysis is very, very slow. Process of dialysis is very, very slow. Therefore, in order to increase speed of uh, dialysis, you know, I can make use of electric field. And especially if the collateral solution is associated with only electrolytes. If the collateral solution is associated with only electrolyte, you know, I can make use of uh, the electric field in order to speed up the process of the dialysis. And of course, uh, that process of dialysis carried out in presence of electric field is called as electrodialysis. That means electrodialysis refers to the dialysis of collateral solution in presence of electric field. So what we call it as electrodialysis. That is one more method for the purification of collides. As I said, this electrodialysis is suitable if a collateral solution is associated with only, if a collateral solution is associated with only, Electrolytes as impurities. 
Okay, now because you know, if I apply electric field across the dialyzer, look at this, I'm applying electric field across the dialyzer by making use of, yes it is electrodes, I'm using cathode and anode, so say for example, this is anode, yes, this is anode, okay now, this will be cathode, you know, cathode is negative plate, anode is positive plate, in presence of uh, electrodes, you know, in presence of electric field, the ions present, present in the collateral solution, the ions present in the collateral solution will be migrating towards the oppositely charged electrode through suitable membrane. Now that, you know that uh, so cat ions, you know, positive ions, they are moving towards negative electrode cathode, anions will be moving towards positive electrode called anode and thereby speed of dialysis will be increased and that's why you know as far as dialysis is concerned, uh, dialysis refers to the the process of removal of dissolved electrolytes from the colloidal solution by means of diffusion through a suitable membrane in presence of electric field. So we call it as electrodialysis. And one important aspect to be kept in mind always, persistent, persistent dialysis of colloidal solution is not permitted. That means complete removal of electrolytes from the colloidal solutions is not permitted because if all the electrolyte present in the collateral solution or completely removed then what happens you know that collateral solution become unstable that is presence of uh, minimum concentration of electrolyte in the collateral solution is very essential that imparts stability to the collateral solution so this is what we call it as uh, electrodialysis yes so we'll see now the next discussion that is one more method for the purification of colloids it will be ultra filtration we'll see that yes let us see third method for the purification of colloids it will be ultra filtration you know the meaning of filtration a simple technique of separating smaller particles from bigger particles using suitable filter filter is characterized by pores on it depending upon the size of the pores in the filter a smaller particles can be separated from bigger particles is it not when the mixture of components are filtered using suitable membrane bigger particles will remain on the filter smaller particles will be passed through the filter is it not that's what we call it as filtration here it is ultra filtration as far as ultra filtration is concerned some method of purification of colloids it's a method of purification of colloids in which collateral particles will be separated from dispersion medium and soluble impurities by using suitable filter which is permeable for all the substances except colloidal particles and that process is called as ultra filtration you know as far as ordinary filter paper is concerned that is ordinary filter paper is permeable for colloidal solutions ordinary filter paper is permeable to particles of colloidal solution also that means even particles of colloidal solution can be passed through ordinary filter paper because the pore size of the ordinary filter paper is greater than size of the colloidal particles because of that you know that is we cannot use ordinary filter paper to bring about uh, separation of colloidal particles from the other substances present in colloidal solution and for that purpose you know we need to reduce the size of the pores present in the ordinary filter paper for that purpose you know ordinary filter paper is soaked with uh, a special solution known as uh, collodion solution in order to reduce pore size of the ordinary filter paper that ordinary filter paper has to be soaked in collodion solution and of course, uh, as far as collodion solution is concerned, this is 4% uh, solution of uh, nitrocellulose. This is uh, collodion is 4% solution of nitrocellulose in mixture of uh, alcohol and ether. That 4% solution of nitrocellulose in a mixture of alcohol and ether is called collodion solution that is in order to convert yes it is uh, ordinary filter paper into ultra filter yes that is in order to reduce pore size of the ordinary filter paper what you need to do is uh, 
ordinary filter paper is soaked in yes it is collodion solution yes ordinary filter paper is soaked in collodion solution and resulting uh, filter paper is hardened by using formaldehyde by using formaldehyde then this uh, hardened filter paper is dried finally this hardened filter paper is is dried finally thereby ordinary filter paper is converted into ultra filter and of course uh, this ultra filter is not permeable for particles of colloidal solution it will be permeable to the soluble impurities and dispersion medium okay it will be permeable to the soluble impurities and dispersion medium that means this ultra filter allows soluble impurities and dispersion medium to pass through it but not the colloidal particles because of that you know now at this moment impure colloidal solution is filtered by using ultra filter then uh, all the soluble impurities and dispersion medium will be passed through the ultra filter finally you left with uh, that is colloidal dispersed surface particles on the surface of yes it is filter ultra filter and which will be removed from the ultra filter okay na and these uh, dispersed surface particles are then dissolved in suitable dispersion medium to form yes it is uh, a pure colloidal solution so this is how ultra filtration can be brought about and at the same time ultra filtration process is once again a slow process and the process the speed of the process can be increased by using by using pressure and also by applying suction okay na so this is what we call it as ultra filtration in order to prepare in order to bring about purification of colloids artha ito anko tini okay na we'll see next discussion it will be properties of colloids yes now let us see next discussion under colloids it will be properties of colloids with respect to the properties of colloids you know we are going to discuss the properties of colloids like uh, the colligative properties optical optical properties kinetic properties and electrical properties these are the properties of colloids that we are supposed to discuss is under the properties of colloids okay na let us see one by one first of all it will be colligative properties you know colligative properties they are the properties of solutions which depend only on the number of solute particles present in a given solution but not on the nature of the solute particles you know that you studied that particular discussion in the chapter solutions the colligative property values of solutions depend only on the number of solute particles present in given solution but not on the nature of the solute particles is it not you know colligative properties like that is uh, relative lowering of vapor pressure depression in freezing point elevation in boiling point and osmotic pressure these are the four colligative properties as far as the solutions are concerned out then and uh, with respect to the colloidal solutions you know the colligative property values of colloidal solutions will be less than the colligative property values of true solutions having same concentration because you know number of colloidal particles in colloidal solutions will be relatively less than the number of particles present in true solutions this is because as you know that uh, the colloidal particles in colloidal solutions will be formed by aggregation of uh, molecules out then the colloidal particles in colloidal solutions will be formed by aggregation of molecules in dispersion medium on account of aggregation of molecules in colloidal solutions you know the number of colloidal particles in colloidal solution will be decreased if the number of particles in colloidal solutions decreased naturally the colligative property values will be decreased because of that you know the colligative property values of colloidal solutions will be less than the colligative property values of true solutions so that is what we call it as the colligative property values agbodala now at this moment you know we'll go to the next discussion it will be the optical properties of colloids agbodala we'll see that optical properties of colloids right so let us see one more property of colloids it will be optical properties of colloids and uh, under that you know we are supposed to study tinol effect as far as optical properties of colloids are concerned here we are going to study something about effect of light on the colloidal solutions we are going to study something about effect of light on the colloidal solutions just imagine if a beam of light is passed through solution of sodium chloride 
path of the light is not visible when it is viewed at right angles to the path of the light. When a beam of light is passed through sodium chloride solution, path of the light is not visible when it is viewed at right, at right angles to the path of the light. Because you know, in the case of sodium chloride solutions, the size of the particles in sodium chloride solutions will be very very small. It will be less than one nanometer. Because of that, you know, these small particles of sodium chloride in sodium chloride solution, they are unable to scatter the light that is passing through their solutions. Because of that, you know, the path of the light is not visible through the solution of sodium chloride. Similarly, when a beam of light is passed through solution of starch, then path of the light is visible when it is viewed at right angles to the path of the light because you know as far as starch solution is concerned this is a colloidal solution you know the size of the particles in colloidal solutions it will be in between 1 nanometer to 1000 nanometer because of that uh, size of the starch particles you know that is uh, the particles of starch are able to scatter the light that is passing through the solution of starch because of that you know a path of the light is visible when it is viewed at right angles to the path of the light and that phenomenon of scattering of light by colloidal particles is called Tyndall effect that is when a beam of light is passed through a solution of colloids the path of the light is visible when it is viewed at right angles to the path of the light and the path of the light is called as Tyndall cone and the phenomenon is called as Tyndall effect so that I can show you like this, you know, just imagine, uh, yes, it is a glass vessel in which, uh, yes, it is a colloidal solution is taken. This is a, a glass vessel in which colloidal solution is taken, okay, now. And uh, when a intense beam of light is passed through the, when intense beam of light is passed through the, yes, it is colloidal solution taken in a glass vessel. Now what happens, you know, the path of the light is visible. The path of the light is visible in the colloidal solutions and that is because of uh, the scattering of light colloidal particles present in a solution so this is what we call it as Tyndall effect and this path of the light in the colloidal solution is called Tyndall cone is called Tyndall cone okay now so that phenomenon of scattering of light by colloidal particles is called as uh, Tyndall effect and of course uh, as far as examples for the Tyndall effect is concerned just to remember the light from the projector in cinema halls that is path of the light from the projector in the cinema halls is clearly visible due to the scattering of light by the various dust particles and smoke, smoke particles present in the theater itself so this is what we call it as best example for the Tyndall effect at the same time just remember the path of the light from headlights of the vehicles is clearly visible in humid atmosphere uh, the path of the light the path of the light from the headlights of the vehicles is clearly visible that's because of the scattering of light by the water droplets present in the humid atmosphere that's because of the scattering of light by water droplets present in the yes it is humid atmosphere apart from that you know for your kind information that is a blue color of the eyes in some people is also because of Tyndall effect just remember the blue color of the eyes in some people is also because of the yes it is Tyndall effect you know that uh, uh, some people will have uh, you know that is black colored eyes some will have uh, brown colored eyes uh, I am talking about uh, the color of the yes it is uh, eyeball in the eyes and that is due to the color of the iris in the eyeball in the case of uh, blue colored iris the amount of melanin in blue colored iris is relatively less compared to the amount of melanin in black colored iris and because of that you know Tyndall effect is found in the case of uh, yes it is blue colored iris and thereby the color of the iris becomes blue that is also due to what we call it as uh, yes it is Tyndall effect and of course like that you know we can give many examples for the Tyndall effect yes and of course uh, as far as uh, the Tyndall effect is concerned now I have prepared one small video where I have conducted some activities in order to demonstrate the phenomenon of Tyndall effect. We'll see those uh, STS activities 
and then we'll come back to our discussion. Angudala, let's see that. Yes. Okay, students. Uh, let me show you some simple activities in order to demonstrate the phenomenon called Tyndall effect. Okay, na. Here I'm going to simple experiments. Smart thing. Either one of them can Tyndall effect. Hey, get it. That's good. Okay, na. Here I got. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, here it is. Uh, this is uh, a glass cup. Okay, na. In which uh, I have taken water, is it not? The water is not a colloidal solution. Look at this. Uh, if I pass a light, you know that is light through this particular water. Just observe the path of the light is not visible. Yes. You know, even the water molecule, no? light and a pass martha. Okay, na? Aganam again. Path of the light is not visible in the water. Because uh, the water particles, you know, water molecules are very, very small. And these uh, small molecules, or unable to scatter the light because of that uh, the path of the light is not visible when intense beam of light is passed through water oh, then, that's why you know we can't observe Tyndall, Tyndall effect okay now in water we can't observe Tyndall effect yes just observe and let me pass the uh, uh, same intense beam of light through this particular solution look at this uh, this particular solution is a colloidal solution okay now if I pass light through this colloidal solution observe the path of the light is visible. Oh, that clearly, path of the light is visible. That is due to the scattering of light by the colloidal particles present in this particular solution. Okay, now this is a solution of starch. You are in this solution. The starch particles, you know, they are going to scatter the uh, light because of that. You know, the path of the light is clearly visible. So this is what we call it as Tyndall effect. Oh, that. Let me show you one more. Yes, it is a simple activity. Here it is a. A uh, glass, okay, na? It's a glass cup. Just observe, this is empty. That means, you know, in this glass, you know, we have air. If I pass, you know, light through this particular glass containing air, that is no Tyndall effect. Or the path of the light is not visible because molecules of air are unable to scatter the light passing through it. Or the so this is no Tyndall effect when light is passing through the air. Or the and let me show you here. This is uh, one more vessel, you know. In this glass vessel, you know, we have uh, some smoke is filled inside the vessel. Some smoke is filled inside the vessel. You now that smoke particles are acting like colloidal particles. Look at this. Uh, if I pass intense beam of light through the this particular, yes, it is uh, the smoke particles, you know, a glass containing smoke particles. Path of the light is clearly visible. Oh, the, so this is what we call it as Tyndall effect. Path of the light can't the end. That is due to the Scattering of light by the smoke particle inside the glass vessel. Other, this is what we call it as Tyndall effect. Apart from that, you know, this sensor, I am passing light, you know, over the, yes, it is, uh, that is uh, blackboard. Other, you know, the blackboard, light spot can't tie there. Other, other, in between that light spot and torch, you know, you cannot see the path of the light. Other, the light spot to the torch, the name again, path can't tie because. In between this light spot and the torch, you know, we have air. Air molecules do not scatter the light. Oh, then. So because of that, you know, no path is visible to you. Oh, now let me see. Uh, if I pass the light through the dust particle in the air, yes. You can uh, Dust particles are Dust particles are not Okay, dust particles are not here. Need again, can't say that. Yes, it is. Path of the light is visible. Oh, then. Because of scattering of light by the dust particles. So these are the some activities which I can use in order to demonstrate phenomenon of Tyndall effect. Okay, now we'll go back to the class, right? Now we'll come back to our discussion. I think uh, you have seen those activities, you have understood that particular Tyndall effect properly. Now we'll come back to our discussion. Yes. Now, as far as uh, the Tyndall effect is concerned, and uh, when intense stream of light is passed through the collateral solution, or the, the path of the light is visible with the blue light when it is viewed at right angles to the path of the light. Generally, the question rises why the path of the light is blue when it is viewed at right angles to the path of the light. The reason is 
and as far as uh, the wavelength of the light scattered by the colloidal particles is concerned it will be in between uh, yes it is uh, 400 nanometers to 750 nanometers this is uh, the wavelength range of uh, the light scattered by the colloidal particles and of course uh, it will be lying in yes it is uh, visible region of uh, electromagnetic spectrum the wavelength range of uh, the light scattered by the colloidal particles it will be in the visible region or uv region of uh, electromagnetic spectrum because you know just observe this particular wavelength range is almost comparable to the uh, size of the colloidal particles that is uh, in between 1 nanometer to 1000 nanometer just observe the size of the colloidal particles the diameter of the colloidal particles will be in between 1 nanometer to 1000 nanometer you know that because of that you know that is the wavelength range of uh, the scattered light by the colloidal particles it will be within 1 nanometer to 1000 nanometer because of that you know that uh, the wavelength of the light scattered by the colloidal particles will be very closer to the the wavelength of the blue colored light very closer to the blue colored light that's why you know path of the light in collateral solution appears blue so with that information you know we'll go to the next discussion what we call it as conditions for tyndall effect yes as far as uh, the conditions of uh, the tyndall effect is concerned tyndall effect is found in the case of collateral solutions only when the following conditions are satisfied we have two conditions if these conditions are satisfied then only collateral solution is going to exhibit yes it is tyndall effect so first condition you know okay now that is diameter of the dispersive base particles should not be much smaller than the wavelength of the light used that is the first condition is the diameter of the colloidal particles should not be much smaller than the wavelength of the light used okay now if uh, the diameter of the colloidal particles is too small compared to the wavelength of light used then the phenomenon of Tyndall effect is not observed that is first condition the second condition is there must be large difference in refractive indices of dispersal phase and dispersion medium if there is a large difference in the refractive indices of dispersal phase and dispersion medium then only that the Tyndall effect is observed as the as the difference in refractive indices of dispersal phase and dispersion medium increases the intensity of the scattered light increases so that is what we call it as second condition there must be large difference in refractive indices of dispersal phase and dispersion medium so these are the, the two conditions that uh, are to be satisfied for tyndall effect to take place right so this is uh, the one more discussion now at this moment you know we'll go to the the next discussion that is what is the importance of this particular Tyndall effect so that is the one more discussion that is uh, importance of uh, importance of Tyndall effect yes importance of Tyndall effect that is uh, the next discussion okay now what are the importance of the Tyndall effect is one can make use of this Tyndall effect in order to distinguish true solutions and collateral solutions because you know true solutions do not show Tyndall effect but collateral solutions show Tyndall effect because of that you know I can easily differentiate true solutions from collateral solutions by using Tyndall effect second importance of this uh, particular Tyndall effect is you now that is the scientist Sigmondi the scientist Sigmondi used this particular Tyndall effect in order to construct ultra microscope the scientist you know Sigmondi used this particular Tyndall effect in order to construct ultra microscope what did he know he focused intense beam of light through the collateral solution taken in as it is a glass vessel the focus of the light is then viewed using microscope at right angles to the path of the beam then what he observed you know in his microscope he was able to observe colloidal particles as bright stars against a dark background that means you know the colloidal particles were appeared as bright spots against a dark background that means you know the scientist Sigmundi 
he was unable to notice the actual colloidal particles in his uh, microscope. That means ultra microscope doesn't make actual colloidal particles visible, but only the light scattered by the colloidal particles can be seen in the microscope. On the basis of this particular observation, what I can conclude at this moment, you know, ultra microscope doesn't provide actual information about size and shape of the colloidal particles. So this is what we call it as uh, the importance of the Tyndall effect as far as the colloidal solutions are concerned. So that is the one discussion what we call it as Tyndall effect. Yes, now at this moment, you know, we'll go to the next topic. It will be color of the colloidal solutions. As color of the colloidal solutions is due to the the wavelength of the light scattered by the colloidal particles at wavelength of the light scattered by the colloidal particles it will be in the range of uh, visible region of uh, electromagnetic spectrum and of course uh, the color of the colloidal solutions depends on the wavelength of the light scattered by the colloidal particles which is in turn depends on size of the colloidal particles you know that that is the color of the colloidal solutions depends on the wavelength of the light scattered by the colloidal solutions which is in turn depends on the size of the colloidal particles as the size of the colloidal particles changes the wavelength of the light scattered by the colloidal particles changes thereby color of the colloidal solutions changes for example if i take a gold sol gold sol has got different colors if i take a gold sol with uh, finest gold particles a gold sol with uh, finest gold particles you know this will be characterized by red color the color of the gold sol with finest gold particles will be red as the size of the gold particles increases the color of the gold sol changes from red to purple then purple to blue and finally blue to gold and yellow this is how the color of the gold sol changes with the size of the yes it is gold particles as the size of the gold particles changes the wavelength of the light scattered by the gold particles changes thereby color changes from red to purple purple to blue blue to blue to gold and yellow that means as the size of the gold particles increases color changes from red to purple purple to blue blue to gold and yellow this is how the wavelength of the light scattered by the colloidal solutions changes with size of the colloidal particles and of course uh, second important aspect is the color of the colloidal solutions depends on the manner in which observer receives the light that is uh, the color of the colloidal solution depends on the manner in which the observer receives the light from the colloidal solutions that means uh, for example if i take a mixture of milk and water that is uh, the mixture of milk the mixture of milk and water will have blue color when it is viewed by reflected light similarly mixture of milk and milk and water will have red color when it is viewed by transmitted light like that you know depending upon the manner in which observer receives the light you know the color also changes right so this is what we call it as uh, the second important aspect and of course uh, so this is something about color of the colloidal solutions now at this moment you know we'll go to the one more important aspect what we call it as brownian moment that is studied under kinetic properties of yes it is collides right we'll see that yes so let us see one more property as far as colloidal solutions are concerned it will be kinetic properties of collides you know kinetic properties will be generally related to the moment of the particles kinetic properties of matter would be related to the moment of the particles is it not like that here also the kinetic properties of collateral solutions will be related to the moment of the colloidal particles in dispersion medium when collateral solution is viewed under powerful ultra microscope it has been observed that you know dispersive phase particles are in a state of continuous zigzag random motion the dispersive phase particles are in a state of continuous random zigzag motion in dispersion medium and that continuous zigzag random movement of the dispersive phase particles in dispersion medium is called brownian moment that means brownian moment refers to the 
continuous zigzag random moment of the dispersive phase particles in dispersion medium is called Brownian moment. Why this Brownian moment is observed in collateral solutions? What is the cause for the Brownian moment of dispersive phase particles in dispersion medium? It is due to the unequal continuous bombardment of molecules of dispersion medium on dispersive phase particles. The main cause for the Brownian moment is you no, know, that is unequal continuous bombardment of molecules of dispersion medium on dispersive phase particles thereby dispersive phase particles gain kinetic energy and they start moving you know as far as the collateral solution is concerned it is a heterogeneous mixture of dispersive phase and dispersion medium your molecules of dispersion medium they are also moving continuously but uh, the moment of the molecules of dispersion medium cannot be seen using ultra microscope only the moment of the dispersive particles can be noticed because you know dispersive phase particles are bigger than molecules of dispersion medium you can notice the moment of the dispersive phase particles in dispersion medium but at the same time one cannot notice the moment of the dispersion medium molecules in ultra microscope and these uh, the molecules of dispersion medium they are going to collide with dispersive phase particles randomly in all the directions thereby dispersive phase particles get kinetic energy and they start moving in dispersion medium so this is what we call it as the cause for the brownian moment and of course as far as significance of this brownian moment is concerned this Brownian moment, this Brownian moment of the dispersive phase particles in dispersion medium imparts stability to the collides. As I said, uh, colloidal solution is a heterogeneous mixture of dispersive phase and dispersion medium. And these dispersive phase particles are suspended in dispersion medium due to the some sort of interaction between molecules of dispersion medium and dispersive phase particles. As long as these dispersive phase particles are suspended in dispersion medium, collateral solution is said to be stable. Once the dispersive phase particles are settled under the influence of gravity, then collateral system is said to be unstable. Just imagine the dispersive phase particles are in a state of continuous movement. These moving dispersive phase particles will not be coming under the influence of gravitational force, thereby settling of dispersive phase particles under the influence of gravity is prevented and that imparts stability to the collides so this is what we call it as importance of the yes it is brownian moment so this is what we call it as importance of the brownian moment and these are the sample these are the properties that i supposed to discuss as far as video number five is concerned okay now in the next video we'll see Remaining properties of collides, Agbudala, we'll see in the next video, right? Thank you.